Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to another Fanboy Planet interview. We've got a great guest today, and it is uh, a Ken Hall, who is an actor who is appearing in the Umbrella Academy, was in People of Earth, and in the Netflix film Polar, you may have known two out of three are a Dark Horse connection, and so uh, there's a comics connection there, and we're really grateful to have today Ken Hall. Ken, hey, hey, everyone. Hey. So uh, you are uh, you have two roles on the Umbrella Academy. So uh, you are, let's see, uh, Herb in the, it, which I'm always forgetting the name of the organization that uh, Number Five works for. But uh, you're yeah, there yeah. in the yeah, commission. commission. That's right. Okay, and and you are the motion capture actor for Pogo. Yeah. So, uh, who I was thrilled to discover uh, because of getting this invitation to talk to you is going to be in, in the second season. So at least in flashback. So I'm very excited for this. So sure. I'm going to open with this. This is kind of interesting. How do you get into the mindset of playing a hyper intelligent chimpanzee? Yeah, uh, it's such a great character. For for one thing, it's like, oh, this is really cool. It's to embody an, an older chimpanzee and to physicalize that is a real cool treat. And uh, so one of the things I, I, I my background is in improv. And so uh, my, myself, my comedy partner, Isaac, we were often very physical when we perform. So for me, it's really fun to try that challenge of embodying uh, a, an animal and also an older animal as well, which I think is a really cool, uh, unique experience. Um, working with my acting coach, uh, I I wanted we basically studying the movements of like how do animals and specifically chimpanzees how do they move and such and again with that additional challenge of how do you incorporate their age how do you know like playing an animal is hard enough but let alone playing like a geriatric like an older you know uh, uh, version of Pogo uh, so there's some research and, and a lot of it was also learning as I went along. And just checking in with the, the special effects people and with the directors that I was working with to be like, how does that look? Does that look realistic? And sometimes you'd be like uh, less human. Uh, and that's the other thing, too. You're straddling both worlds of being animal. And yet Pogo is still like has so many um, human personified qualities to him as well. So, again, bringing the gentleness in there uh, along with the age and the fact that Pogo is a chimpanzee, but also very human like as well. Yeah, that's, I hadn't really thought about the age part there, but it, one of the things in there is, of course, it, it, it is uh, being Pogo is voiced by another actor. So how do you strike all that balance when you're give, probably, I'm assuming, giving your all here and someone else is going to do the voice? Yeah, it's a, it's a cool thing that's done in tandem. It's myself and Adam Godley. Uh, Adam Godley is the voice in the face uh, of, uh, of Pogo. Um, and it's interesting because when I'm on set, I do my thing. And then, uh, and then all of that stuff is going to be sent to Adam, uh, in LA. And so Adam's in the studio watching and he is, he's got all the stuff on his face and so they can track, you know, all, all of the movements and the language and, and, and how he's voicing it. So for me, again, it's, it's, it was really important for me going into first season, uh, in particular that I, I want to do a good job and I want to bring. You know, I really I want to bring all of it to to the to the performance, even though it's not going to be my voice. Uh, it's still like I want to I bring I want to bring that authenticity uh, within that. And uh, so I do the stuff on set and then uh, and then uh, that'll be sent to, to Adam. Adam be working with directors in basically a sound booth where he can like watch and put his voice to the movements and and to and also to fine tune his reactions, his facial expressions. Uh, as well. So it's, again, it's a really cool process of, of, and it was great. Actually, the, the premiere uh, last year was the first time I got to meet him. And I actually met him in line doing a red carpet experience. I was literally getting interviewed by someone and they're like, Hey, what's it like working with Adam? I'm like, I don't know. I've never met him yet. He's right beside me. I'm, I hope I'm going to meet him pretty soon, actually. Uh, and so I, I did get to meet him and uh, it was great. It was a really lovely guy. He's very, very down to earth. And, um, uh, and, and that was cool to, to get that, to have that experience of like two sides of Pogo kind of coming together. Yeah. And, and you do get to play Herb, of course, as well. Yep. So, so you perform as yourself, you get to be in a motion capture suit and, 
Uh, the first time I was aware of you as an actor was in People of Earth, oh, and Jack yeah. the Alien, which I loved. Uh, you know, so you've done prosthetics, yeah. and you know, how do you approach the work differently for each one? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, for Jeff, that was very involved because that uh, it was a different challenge. That was a, a, quite a, a challenge, uh, actually, because the prosthetic that I was wearing for, so for Jeff the Grey, the big sort of gray-headed, iconic, you know, black-eyed aliens, um, that was a, a three-part prosthetic. So it was like basically pulling a hat on. And so my face would be exposed, but massive head is on top of my, in top of my head. And then they would glue the, the, the cow part on my face. And then part of the chin would be glued on. And the challenge for that specifically was that the nostrils for Jeff are, are actually above where my nostrils are. And so I was really breathing through my eye sockets and, uh, <laughs> and that was a real challenge. So we'd have to like, you know, give myself a bit of glue under or like not as not glue it down super tight because I needed some space that I could actually take in air from my eyes to funnel it down to my nose. And uh, in between, uh, so right before we're about to go into shooting the scene, the eyes would be placed in and my ears would be covered by the prosthetic. So I, I really had challenge hearing, smelling and breathing and also seeing because my eyes, my eyeballs would fog up. So after the take, it'd be like, great cut. They'd have to pull them out, sort of wipe them down to put them back in. For Pogo, it was a different, it was great. I just show up, I get in my in my suit, which is like made for me and I'm ready to go. <laughs> like I, I didn't even meet the hair and makeup people till like four months or so into it when we started doing, when they, they brought me in for playing Herb. Um, but that being said, playing, playing pogo and trying to physicalize pogo that has its own challenge because you want to be very mindful again of those movements and that's why I put, I put a lot of prep into it. i work with an acting coach here in toronto so that's for both of those roles in particular i just find working with my acting coach as uh, name is michael gordon shore and it's just that's it's so important so part of the technique and so part of the process to really full heart wholeheartedly know those characters and to discover more of those nuances within those characters for example with pogo he walks with a cane and by the end of that's like the six months or so that we're shooting it it became such a comfortable position to put pogo in and it, there was a real as i said a really nice comfort there was a familiarity to it and uh but it takes some time to to find that and to figure that out and to make it your own. And I, I wanted to be very intentional to show up prepared and, and ready to do it and and uh, to bring my best to it. And you have a, a big improv background. You're part of a, a two man troupe, I guess, uh, which is called two man no show. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I, how has your improv background, what do you, you know, influenced your film and TV performances? What, what do you think that brings that gives you that edge? It's such a giant asset to have. <clears throat> I never went to film school. Really, my acting training was in doing improv. And I've been doing improv for 16 plus years, which was just initially a hobby that I was really interested in getting into. And I never really done improv before. It was very scary <laughs> to start, but I just realized it was such a big part of my life that I'd been missing the sense of play and the sense of connection with others and collaborating and creating in the moment. And what I found then uh, as I've transitioned into doing more in film and TV over the last like eight, eight years or so, especially is that the improv is such a great, this idea of, of being in the moment and being very malleable and going with the flow, so to speak, is invaluable to have on a set. And as they're saying, I like to show up to said, like being really prepared because there's a lot of pressure. There's an entire crew and a lot of money <laughs> that's, that are taking a chance on you to do a good job. And so you're hired to deliver and to really show up and, and to give it your best. And so for me, when you're, especially when you're getting those redirections as well, that you are able to take that, make those quick adjustments and, and just roll with it. And so uh, improv for me is a giant asset and I feel like it's such an integral part of even the audition process for me I'm always a big fan I'm always I love comedy and, and especially here in uh in in Canada which I imagine is the same in the states 
is that a lot of actors that you see in, in commercials, especially funny commercials, are improvisers because they're so good of, of riffing on the copy that they're getting and adding more to it that maybe the, the, the people initially hadn't even seen. So it's, a, it's an incredible skill, uh, both for professionally, for uh, film and TV, for the audition process. But I find the rules of improv is an excellent way to live life. The idea of being open and, 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 and rather than blocking people or trying to like drive your own agenda, it's like, great, let's collaborate. What are you bringing to the table? I'm going to honor that. I'm going to celebrate that. So I, I found that it's, it's been a really uh, effective way to live and, uh, and to go through life, being open and saying yes to things. And, and what drew you into it in the first place? Because you said that was, uh, it was not an intention. It was just kind of a thing to do for fun. And then suddenly it's been the basis of your career. Yeah, it, it, you know, it, it's really interesting how I, how it came to be. I was, uh, I didn't really do much in my 20s. Uh, I played in a punk band and, and drank a lot and that was it. And there's not a lot of transferable skills that goes along with that. Yeah. So I, I quit drinking actually when I was 28. I, I, I know, I, I realized I'm like, you know, this is a problem and I gotta, I gotta do something about it. So uh, I quit drinking and for the first time I'm like, who am I? You know who am I without that, and and all of you know everything that went along with that, and and so for me it was an opportunity to try and figure out who I was. I started to go back into social work and volunteered at a youth shelter for a year, and I was trying to find myself. And part of that was uh, I stumbled upon creative writing. Uh, I did creative writing night school classes, uh, and that was really cool. For the first time in my life, in my late twenties, I I realized I was actually a very creative person. And I had no idea. I had no idea that that was such a high thing on my list of what really was feeling something good that was nurturing for me. So I did that for a couple of years. And then literally the night before registration ended, I was like, I want to do something else. In addition, I was looking for change. I was hungry for change, but I didn't know what, what it was. And I had no frame of reference to, to be like, oh, it's definitely this. But I, on a whim, I just I was going through the course calendar and I, I saw the theater uh, land on the theater page and and saw beginner's drama and I got really scared and I got really excited at the same time next thing I knew I was signing up it was an out-of-body experience because there was still a part of me is like that's not you that's not who you are and I understand that voice it was trying to keep me safe and you know of what I knew and but that wasn't I needed change and I was there was more desire to see change rather than to stay with what I knew and I didn't tell anyone I kept it a secret for, for about seven weeks or so. And then I told my best friend and he's like, great, you should have been doing that a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's what I, I just never stopped. And I'd signed up to do an intermediate class, but not enough people signed up for it. But someone in my class was like, you're pretty good, man. You should go to Second City here in Toronto. And I was like, oh boy. But I realized I'm like, now that I had a taste for it, it's kind of like the Matrix where he had like the, you know, more <laughs> like, like red and blue And I'm like, let's have the red. All right, great. And once you have it, once you taste that, something that, because I, I didn't, growing up, my life was pretty serious for a long time. I was a very scared person and, and just a lot of anxiety and fear to unpack. And so in my teens, in my 20s, it was, there was some pretty serious times. And um, discovering improv especially was the thing of like, this is the idea of play. And the idea of connecting with other people, allowing myself to ex to be okay with expressing myself in a group of people, that was, it was without a hangover, <laughs> without, you know, <laughs> any kind of intoxicants. It was like, this is something beautiful and pure and something that I wanted to keep safe and incubate. And I, so that's when I started to do a level A class at Second City. And I never stopped. And it was when people start to find improv, you're an improv person yourself. When you find it, it's like, this is, there's so much good stuff within this. And the people in the community are so good. The whole idea is it's really, it's, it's leaving judgment aside and, and just seeing what, you know, really honoring what people bring to the table. And I just find that that's such a great way to live and, and to exist. So this idea of play had been missing in my life. So when I found it, I'm like, I need to have more of this. And I've been so lucky. I, I met my best friend in doing improv. We literally right now, we would have been doing a show as part of the Toronto Fringe Festival, but wow. due to COVID and this would be our 11 year anniversary to like basically today is our 11 year anniversary of being a duo. 
uh, <laughs> I got to call him. I got to, I got to remind him of the best. It's pretty remarkable. And we were set to do a new show here in Toronto, uh, where we give the audience balls <laughs> to throw at us. And if they didn't like anything, we would throw a ball and we would change. <laughs> so it's like, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a real, it's something that we worked on over the past like year or so, but that's our thing. It's like, we're happy. We're very comfortable with clown improv with sketch and stuff but it's like we want to bring the audience on on an ex, on a ride and experience and it's just the the, uh, the evolutionary process of what improv has done for me and how it's changed my life is uh it's not just me it's like that happens with a lot of other people that 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 dip into improv so uh once i tasted it i'm like i got to keep doing this and my life has changed dramatically and you've you know, you mentioned like you volunteered at a youth shelter and so forth. And, and now you are a motivational speaker on top of everything else. And you advocate for uh, casting with physical diversity. And mm -hmm. in, in the time that you've really taken that in, in hand, have, mm -hmm. have you seen it changing? Are you, you know, are, you got reasons to be, you know, very optimistic? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm so... Uh, I'm really inspired by what's happening recently with Black Lives Matter, for example, and just the systemic changes that are possible. I grew up um, seeing the, the police, for example, as being this very structured, institutionalized organization that and almost with a sense of like discouragement that things can not change. It's just the way it is. So just accept it. But I'm really inspired by hearing people's stories and seeing action over the last month or so of change is possible. And if things that have been so rigid and so like, it, this is just the way it is, there's no change in it. If that is able to change, then for me, I mean, that's just the, the external changes that are happening there. I feel like I can bring in into my own life. And it's not, again, it's just not an isolated thing. I feel like people are so hungry for change and looking to, we're in change. The pandemic is gigantic change. This is forced change. But I feel like it's so in keeping with like, let's change a lot of things. And that comes with casting as well. And that comes with like, how do we view people? And and are we really seeing all of the person? And uh, I know for myself, over the many years that I've been doing film and TV, uh, there's been a lot of times that I've been cast for my size. I'm four, seven and three quarters. And I don't know how many elf roles <laughs> that I've auditioned for. <laughs> And, and 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 have booked and I, I, you know I, I'm grateful to have those experiences. Now I'm in a place though, and have been in the last few years, where I'm like, uh, I'm much more than just my size, and that uh, it's been really affirming, especially playing Jeff the Gray, to be like to to be able to hold my own and to for me even to see like I can actually bring much more to this than than seeing my height as a punchline or that seeing you know someone's size as being you know just the comedy it's like no 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 there's so much more to myself than just simply my size and i feel like that's the same with everyone and so i i'm very i'm very impressed and and inspired and optimistic that things can change and that i think people want to turn on their tv or show and or, and to see life being reflected yeah. and differences. And when we grow up, when if we see everyone, again, it's like we just accept it as the norm because it is. Everyone's the same in so many ways. We all want to laugh. We all want to love, you know. And, and so I feel like there is a place for all of us. And uh, I'm inspired by this. And, and for me, that's been very affirming to own more of my own experiences. And I grew up thinking that being small was my problem. And that I had to grow a thicker skin when I hear short jokes. I'm like, oh, that's on me. I got I to gotta make a difference. And I got to just suck it up, you know? That's on me. And I realized just recently, actually, that I'm like, oh, that's not my problem. That's, that's your problem. <laughs> you know, like that's not, for me, I, I really, I'm learning to like myself much more than ever before. And to, to own that and to embody that. And I, I, I'm hoping that that people writing, casting, things like that are revolving and seeing people for just being people and seeing beyond more of just the surface, just the artifice that we put up there. So I'm in, I'm really encouraged by that. And uh, I'm very I'm seeing signs externally that th that change is happening. And so I, I'm 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 so on board with that. I think it's wonderful.
And with your improv partner, you've also done some sketch writing. And as you mentioned, you you creative writing, fiction writing as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, So are you taking some of that into hand, like trying to develop more material for yourself? Yeah, it's funny. I, I back in December, my comedy partner Isaac, uh, he lives in LA actually, and oh. so I live in Toronto. So we're in two different countries, but you know, he he has family here, so he comes up every few months, and vice versa. I'll go down there. I have a manager in LA, so I'll go down and and, and spend some time there. And and so uh, you know, we often find time to do shows, but it's maybe not as more uh, not as often as we can. So often we'll be doing, we're as I said, we're going to do our new show here. But we're also doing solo stuff. And back at the uh, in December, <laughs> uh, myself and a friend, we did a double bill. I did forty five minutes. And my friend Gord did forty five minutes here in a theater that he that he uh, that he bought basically and turned in. is called Sweet Action Theater, dedicated to more clown, physical comedy, things like that. So I did a show that was inspired <laughs> by a janitor, and I wanted to bring both of these worlds of storytelling. I want to bring more of me into that i want to be more authentically me and i i also want to be silly and and ridiculous so i i designed a, a show and i was working with my director chris gibbs of i want to create a show that's half storytelling and half clown so half of it is like a janitor i'm playing a janitor i'm going around and i'm cleaning up the space and i'm throwing out people's trash and stuff but then i transition into being more storytelling and i start talking about what if we throw out a lot of the labels and the trash that we've accumulated that we think about ourselves and our self-talk and such. So for me, I'm like, that was an opportunity. I want to give back and I want to help people get rid of their own self-talk, all the trash and garbage that we, that we, you know, the messages that we've had growing up that we think we're not enough, or we, you know, we think we can't certain do, you know, do certain things or that we're only, you know, we can only fit in particular boxes. So for me, it was great fun. I'm like, I want to do a show where I get to be, uh, an idiot <laughs> and make people laugh, but also be very real at the same time and straddle those those two worlds. So we did three nights in a row, uh, and it was great. So that's that's for me. I'm like that's that's exciting for it to show up there. And the work that I've done with Isaac, we've always we've 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 always been considered underdogs in many ways. And Isaac has a long history of not fitting in as well he he's been bigger he's once he got to la he lost a lot of weight and uh he you know, he's more spry these days but we both have a lot of pain and a lot of hurt and healing to do but we, we wear that on our sleeves and that's the, the the lives that we've had so we get to bring those elements into the shows that we do and so that was in the first show literally 11 years ago probably maybe even to this date that um that we get to really embrace more of being ourselves and and more of our voices so rather than trying to to sound or or play to a particular kind of audience we are we've just we're very lucky that we've just found our own style and that's just from being ourselves and uh, people have given us this this label of clown prof for example and it's <laughs> and that's great i mean we do uh, improv, but it's uh, done in a very unorthodox way because we break that fourth wall. The reason being, we did a sketch show 11 years ago, but we were not good writers. And so a lot of our jokes would bomb <laughs> and be like, let's improvise something then. Let's try and get the audience back. Let's win them over. So that's how like the, we didn't really have a show. That's why it's our name, Two Minute Show. We didn't really have a show literally a month out before we opened. So it's nice to bring the audience uh, into this mix and and to, to be, again, it's very affirming of like you being you, there is no one like you, so be you <laughs> and you're gonna find, you know, it's gonna feel better too. Like you're doing, at least at the end of the day, you're doing your own stuff. So rather than, you know, wait for trying to get, you know, picked up or trying to like, it's just like you're you're satisfying yourself and you're having fun i get to play with my best friend and I'm, I'm very grateful to have that kind of experience and to make an audience laugh is such one of the best feelings and at the same time getting to own who you are so in our first show i have major scoliosis so we got to we got to sing about that and we got to sing about those perceived weaknesses but we got to own them so they become our strengths yeah. And some of your work can be found online on, on YouTube. Uh, I did a little search last night, watched Jurassic Date yeah. and uh, some of the Detroit Improv Festival to look up Two Man No Show and uh, you will find 
that you will find uh, some of Canon Isaac's work. So uh, thank you so much for this, for this conversation. I want to remind people that the Umbrella Academy Season 2 will uh, be dropping on July 31st on Netflix in the U.S. I'm not sure if that's the worldwide date, but but there it is. Um, of course, you're, you can be seen in Polar, and I've lost track of where People of Earth went in streaming. <laughs> services, but... iTunes. Check it out on iTunes. iTunes. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you so much for the time, <laughs> Ken. Thanks, Derek. I appreciate the conversation. it. And thanks, all of you, for watching. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>